Let's, uh, let's stand to sing together number 59 in our red hymn book. I'll sing the mighty power of God. come in your presence today and just thank you for your gift of, of love toward us and the gift of your son that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and our prayer Lord that be as we commence and throughout this morning Lord that there would be none that would leave this place that wouldn't know for sure of salvation through Christ our Lord so we commend to you and just ask your blessing from the beginning to the end Lord that it be to your honor and glory and we ask it all in Jesus name amen you may be seated just thinking of that last hymn that we just sang. That everything is in his power that makes the glory known. The clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. Everything is in his, at his hand. We're going to sing one more together before uh, we do the announcements. Uh, Lord, what an, how great thou art. Thank you. Uh, number four in the red hymn book. <coughs>
Bible. John Bennett with us again from Faith Mission. Really glad to have John. He was here just a few weeks ago, and and uh, a lot of people came to us after and really appreciated John's John and his message. So we trust that the Lord will bless his message to us again this week. So one more, and then we're going to ask John to come up on Jordan Stormy Banks. for the welcome. It's great to be back again and uh, thank you those who came who were here a few weeks ago and you came back again. You're gluttons for punishment but uh, thank you. Uh, it's great to share together here and what great singing. It's just wonderful. I love to be in a service where people sing up and sing out and, and just praise God and I think you did that today and it was just great. That's what, how uplifting it is. We're going to read some scriptures from Second Timothy. <coughs> A few verses from the end of chapter 3 and then into chapter 4. 
Uh, they say that this is probably the last letter that Paul wrote, or certainly near the end of his life. And he's giving some advice to Timothy, a young uh, evangelist, a young leader, church leader, and he's sharing with him some of his advice. And uh, while we're not necessarily looking at this passage fully today, but I want to read from verse um, 14 of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me on that day, and not to me only, but unto all those who also who have loved his appearing. Amen. May God bless his word to us today. Just a little prayer. Our Father, thank you again for your word, that it is indeed a living word to our hearts. And we pray that you will bless your word to us today. Help us to grasp what you want to say and to be obedient to your voice. We ask for the anointing of your spirit upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Paul's advice to Timothy here in this chapter 4, in verse 2, three words, preach the word. If you have a Bible in your hand, and I'm sure everybody has a Bible at home, you're holding the most precious, most wonderful, prized possession that anybody could have in this entire world, the Word of God. This book stands out supreme above every other book that has ever been printed, the Word of God. Just want to mention a few things about the Word of God that we hold in our hand today. The Word of God is a history book. He says, preach the Word. Well, this Word is a, a, the Word is a history book. Going right back, and I just started recently to read again in Genesis, going right back from the very beginning. If you want to know the history of this world and the history of mankind, go to the Word. The Word. It's interesting, isn't it, that uh, all kinds of exploration and scientific uh, experiments are being carried out at enormous cost to try to discover where we came from. And all you got to go is to the first chapters of this book, and you got the answer without any expense. It's there. It's a history book, record of creation, how it all happened. This whole universe, it's there, a history book. The fall, we look at our world and people hold up their hands and say, what's happening to our world? If you want to know the answer, it's in the history book. 
Back here, you'll find it in Genesis. How sin entered into the world. How we have been born with that sinful inherited nature now. A record of God's dealing with nations. Just see how God dealt with nations right from the beginning, right through. It's a history book. And, and you know, it, there is no history book like it. Because it's true. History books are all flavored by whoever wrote them. But this history book is the word of God. Speaking about the coming of Jesus. His birth. His life, his death, his resurrection, it's a history book. Facts, history. It's not only a history book, but the word is a handbook. You know, you buy a new car and uh, you get a handbook with it. You buy a washing machine or something else, you get a handbook with it. What's the purpose of the handbook? Well, of course, it's to give you instructions as to how to operate and and we have a handbook here giving instruction about the road of life that we're on giving us a handbook telling us how to live you know I was thinking about this during this week if we just took ten commandments that we find in the book of Exodus chapter 20 and just took those ten simple commandments and if the world lived by them what a different world we would be living in a handbook for life a handbook for governments to rule countries by a handbook for families the world the, the word is a handbook of course we come over into the New Testament and we have all the teaching of Christ the great sermon on the mount in Matthew 5 and 6 there, we have all of the teachings of the apostles and Paul and, and various ones. A handbook telling us how to life, pe how to live. People are looking, you know, for all kinds of answers. What does it say? It's profitable for instruction, for direction, for reproof and rebuke. It's a handbook for life. Not only a handbook telling us how to live, but it's a handbook that gives protection to us because when we hide God's word in our heart, it says, hide the word of God that we might not sin against him. A handbook producing fruit in our life. Jesus told that wonderful parable of the sower going out to sow seed. Of course, it was the word of God he was talking about. But he used the illustration, and there's a lot of farmers in here, and you know right well what it is to go out, and you don't go out and scatter your seed up along the roadway because it's not going to do any good. The birds are going to take it away. But he talks about the good soil, and when the word is sown in good soil, it brings forth good fruit for the glory of God. What a book we got in our hand. One book, and it's all there producing fruit. fruit. The word uh, is precious. And it, it, it is a word that brings conviction and brings instruction, a handbook. It's a means of renewing our mind. You know, you take your car into the mechanic and you want to get it kind of reconditioned and renewed, you know, so it'll run a little bit better. How do we run better? We come to the word and our minds are renewed by the word of God day by day. It's a handbook. It's more than that. The word is a holy book. It's a holy book. You know, many Bibles have got on, on the front cover, Holy Bible. It's a holy book. There is none other like it. It's God's book. What a book it is. You know, what they said about Jesus, never man spoke like this man. Well, never has there been a book right, written like this book. It's a holy book. It's inspired by none less than the Holy Spirit himself. You know, we talk about all the different authors that are, wrote down the words. But really, all they were doing was lending their hand and their mind to the Holy Spirit because he is the real author of this book. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine and correction and all the rest. It is a holy book. 
That, of course, is why we must never take away from it. We must never try to explain it away. We must never try to add to it because it is a holy book, God's word. What a book. No wonder Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. Preach the word. You know, one of the tragedies is that sometimes today we're more inclined to, people are more inclined to take the word of some famous personality than take the word of God. We're more inclined sometimes to take the word of some teacher than the word of the teacher, the Holy Spirit himself. Preach the word. The word is a history book. The word is a handbook. This book is a holy book. You know, this book is his book. It's his book. Right from the word in Genesis, right through to the end of Revelation, this book is all about our Savior, him, the Savior. He is the one in the Old Testament. Yes, in many cases, he's concealed there. We don't hear his name. We don't hear all, uh, much, many, uh, well, we hear, there are many mentions of his name, but in a, in a concealed way, Emmanuel. God with us, and so on. But, but when we come into the New Testament, of course, he's revealed as the Son of God. His book, when we come to the Christmas time and Christmas season of the year, and we look into that manger and we see a baby lying there, all of the Old Testament history and, and scriptures have been pointing his book pointing to that very moment when a virgin would bring forth a son and his name would be called Jesus. It is his book. His book. The word of God. His book. All through our reading of the scripture, we have the written word, the written word of God from Genesis to Revelation, is the written word of God. But you know there's a scripture, and I want us to kind of spend a little bit of time thinking about this today. The Bible says that the word, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And you see, when we come to the scripture, we're not only hearing about the word, the written word, but the written word is given to us to reveal the living word. The living word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Lying in the manger that day was the creator of the universe, was the longed for Messiah, was the King of Kings, was the Lord of Lords, was the Son of God, was the Word. The Word. In the beginning, what does it say in, in John? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and without Him was not anything made that was made. You see, while this is the most precious book that anybody could ever have in their hands, and so it is, and should be your most prized possession in your home. You know, they used to have this, I don't know if it's still on, but they used to have this Desert Island program. Uh, I suspect it was here, but it used to be back in, in the UK and Ireland uh, when they would ask somebody, you know, if you, were, if you were stranded on a desert island, what book would you like to have? And they would have them talk about the book. But they would always say, apart from the Bible, and the understanding would have been that that would have been the first book that anybody should choose. It is the most prized possession. But you know, all that this book is doing is pointing us to the living word. The living word. The one who is alive and alive forevermore. You see, the, old, the, 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 the written word tells us the whole purpose of it, of the written word, 
is to show us who God is and to lead us to God. And the purpose of the living word coming, becoming flesh and dwells among us was to reveal who God is to us. What did Jesus say? He who has seen me has seen the Father. You see, the, the, the scriptures, this, this book is pointing us and telling us who he is. Now we're actually looking at the very one who has revealed to us what he's like and who he's like. The living word. See how it is. This book from Genesis to Revelation reveals to us God's standard, God's pattern, God's plan for living. And when we look at the living word, he is actually a revelation of God. What God expects and longs for in all of us. A holy life lived for the glory of God. This book shows to us God's abhorrence of sin. God's judgment upon sin. You, you find it right in the very beginning. That's why God put Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. And that's why God sent judgment on nations of the world. Ah, nation after nation experienced judgment because of sin. Sodom and Gomorrah were judged and destroyed because of their sin and so many others. But when you come to the living word, there's nowhere you see more clearly God's judgment and God's wrath upon sin as when you look to see the living word hanging on a cross, bearing man's sin. In my place condemned he stood. You know, even the Son of God, as he hung there, his very Father turned his back upon him as he bore the sin. God's judgment upon sin. Jesus took on himself the sin of the world. And God gave him up for us. We see it. What the written word tells us we see enacted, worked out in the very person of the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures are pointing right from Genesis when the fall took place. And God said that there would, from the seed of a woman, would bruise Satan's head. The Savior was promised. And right through we see the Savior promised. And now we see the living word, the Savior himself, revealed to us on that wonderful day. You know, I don't know how, what happens to you when you read the, the written word. I hope you get excited. Because this word is all about the living word. We talk about praying that the word would live. Well, it does live in the person of Jesus Christ and live in our hearts by him. See, when Jesus came, the history maker, the history book, reveals to us the history maker. The handbook reveals to us the one who enables us to live that kind of life. The holy book reveals to us the holy one himself, Jesus Christ, and his book reveals him to us day by day. No wonder Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. The written word is a, is, a, is a revelation of the living word. The written word gives to us the truth. But Jesus is the truth. If you see how they all match dovetail together. The written word shows us the way and talks about the way but Jesus is the way. The written word tells us about the life and how we're, what real life is about. Jesus is the life. The written word talks about the door. And Jesus said, I am the door. And so we could go on talking about it. It shows us the way of salvation, but he is our salvation. Tells us about judgment, but he is the judge. Tells about a life of victory, but he is our victory. Points to the light, but Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so it goes on and on. Speaks about a good shepherd. 
And Jesus is that very good shepherd. You know, when the word speaks, the word speaks. Isn't that true? When you read this book, read it, and at the same time listen to the word, Jesus Christ himself. And when we get to know, we want to get to know this word. And uh, it's lovely to be here in a, in a, in a, in a Bible fellowship where I, I know that many of you, if not all of you, want to get to know the word. But why do we want to get to know the word? So we can get to know the word. It's true. We're to love the word. Why? So that we might love the word. Study the word so that we might study the word. You know, if you come to the Bible, and, and, and I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, what should I say, discouraged sometimes today. That so many people come to the word of God just to get their heads filled with knowledge about this book. And there's nothing wrong with filling your head with knowledge about this book. In fact, there's a, a, a man who used to go to, it, uh, and still goes to a, a church in Oakville. He's a professor in McMaster University. He's a professor of New Testament. And he's not in a divinity site. He's, he's just in the regular university. And he has students that come to study the New Testament as literature, just to get to know it. But you know, that's not the purpose of the New Testament. It's to get to know the Word Himself. Somebody said, you know, it's important to go through the Word, but it's much more important to let the Word go through us. Isn't it? We need to let the living Word go through us. Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, preach. The word. Preach the word. What was he saying? Oh, he was saying preach the, the, the scriptures, yes. But I think he was saying preach Christ. Preach Christ, the living word. Because Paul knew he, that, of what Jesus had said. Preach Christ. And, and I, I am so blessed and have been so blessed as I have thought about this, this thought about the living word, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. The word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. This is the written word. Jesus is the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. But you know, it goes a little step further than that. Because the living word, the written word reveals the living word. And the living word became flesh and lived on this earth. But now the living word wants to become flesh and dwell in this world in your heart and in my heart. You know, it's not enough just to recognize this word as God's word. It's not enough just to recognize Jesus as the living word. But he wants actually to come and dwell within our hearts. And that the living word, the written word by the power of the living word, would be lived out in your heart and in my heart. It goes right to our very personal walk with God. And I don't know about everybody this morning, but you know, you might know the scriptures. Actually, I was thinking about a little illustration to try and illustrate what I'm wanting to say. And I was thinking, you know, if I came to you this morning and I made a promise, I said, you know, um, I'll shovel your, clean your driveway for you whenever the snow comes. And I'll bring you coffee from Tim Hortons every time I come to see you. And I'll wash your car when it gets dirty. And I could list a whole big list of things that I said I will do. These promises that I make. Here's what I'll do for you. Here's what I'll do. And you look at me and say, John, that is great. I'm going to write those down. And so you write them down, all those promises. And you, you, you look at them every day and you think, man, I should learn these off by heart. And you begin to memorize them. 
Here's what he said. Here's the promises. And you think, well, maybe, maybe it'd be nice if I had them on the wall. And so you get a frame and you frame them up and hang them on a wall. And every day you look at those promises. John said he will wash the car, he'll clean the driveway, he'll bring coffee, he'll do and all these things. And day after day you memorize them and you look at them and you are just happy about them. But nothing happens. They're not doing you one little bit of good. They're just a waste of time having them there. Why? Because you know you need to make contact with me if you're going to get that done. Do you know, some people memorize the scriptures. They know it, they read it, they memorize it. They even get it made and put in a little plaque like this on the wall. Another one over here. And they're hanging their home. But it's not doing anything for them. It's not changing their life. Why? Because they've never got in touch with the one who made the promise. You see, it is the word here written down under my hand. And Jesus is the living word. And Jesus, God made these promises for us. But until we make contact with him, until we get in touch with him, until Jesus Christ becomes Lord of our life and comes to live within us, all of these promises are not doing us one little bit of good. They're just nice words on a page. Or nice texts on the wall in our home. And it may be somebody listening to this message this morning. And you appreciate the word. And you like those texts. And you love the words that Jesus promised. You know and the things he said. But they're not a reality in your personal experience. You've never come to know the living word. Who is revealed to us in the written word. And if I can encourage you today, if you're a questioning person, if you're somebody who is wanting to know the answer to life, get into the living, into the written word. And in this written word, ask God to reveal the living word to you. And when he reveals Jesus Christ to you, you surrender your life to him and give him full control of everything you are and everything you ever will be. And he will become the Lord in your life. Preach the word. Of course, the scripture here that we read talks about in the last days, you know, that people will, will be uh, just kind of love to, their ears to be tickled. And they'll, obviously I heard you studying about false teachers and, and this scripture under, underlines that, you know, that we need to be careful. But we need to preach the word, the whole counsel of God. It's not what the philosophers say. It's what the word of God says that matters. Somebody, I remember hearing and telling a story about somebody who, you know, was a preacher and um, he denied much of the scriptures. He liked to pick what he liked from it and the rest he kind of put aside. And so when he would be pre speaking from the New Testament and speaking about the miracles or the Old Testament uh, and uh, he would, he would say, you know, well, he would have an explanation as to how people misunderstood what was supposed to be a miracle, uh, but it really wasn't a miracle at all. And he would preach like that, and there was this person sitting in the congregation listening to them, and some uh, time later, this uh, preacher went to visit in this home. And uh, before the preacher was going to leave, uh, the person in the home said, I, well, would you like to read some scripture? And handed the Bible to this preacher. And he opened the Bible up and he, there was bits cut out here and bits cut out there and bits cut out somewhere else. And, and uh, he said, oh, what did you do to the Bible? You can't do that with the Bible. And uh, this lady said, well, she said, I, I wanted a Bible that I can trust and I just cut out all those pieces that you said that weren't trustworthy, weren't miracles. Uh, and so I wanted a Bible. I wanted to know how much I could believe. And, of course, it woke the preacher up. 
Friends, we don't pick and choose out of this, do we? No, the whole of Scripture is given by inspiration of God, pointing to the Word of God. And then the Word of God wants to come to live within the heart of you and I so that we might live before others. And the Bible that most people read in your community, in my community, is your life and my life. And in the New Testament, we have the word that became flesh and dwelt among them. And in 2020, the word needs to become flesh and dwell among the people of Exeter, the people of Huron County. The word needs to be seen living and walking in our shoes as he comes to dwell within us. And my prayer is today that we will not only preach the word as somebody comes to stand in this pulpit Sunday by Sunday and as you have your Bible class that not only will the word be preached but the word will be preached by the life we live every single day. Preach the word by life, by lip, by example. Preach the word. You know, I, I think you'll agree with me that we're living in a time when many people know nothing about what's in this book. They have never read it. And it, what they hear people say about it sometimes is uh, denying its truth. But one thing I believe that people cannot deny is a godly life lived before them and when somebody sees the living word living in your heart and in my heart lived out before them in their community that will be the very thing sometimes that will give them a desire to get into the written word to find that living word for themselves I know I'm emphasizing and overemphasizing the thought this morning but I do it with with, with a purpose that we might see not only the, the written word and not only Jesus as the living word, that, but that we might experience what the written word tells us about the living word living in our lives day by day by the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that true of your life? It can be. He can be. That's why he came. He came to be your savior. He came to be your Lord. He came to live out his life through us. Scripture talks about the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that inspired the written word the Holy Spirit that takes now the living word and lives his life through us. Ah, what, a, what, a, what a plan God has for all of us. The plan of God's salvation is beyond human understanding. It's so wonderful that God would take me and God would take you and put that living word in our hearts and give us the Holy Spirit so that others will see Jesus living in Huron County. May God help us today. I want us to sing number 270 in closing. Uh, I don't have the hymn book up here, but let me get one. Two hundred and seventy speaks about the wonderful words of life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. And I want you to think about this as we sing it. Not just printed words on a page, but wonderful words of life walking around Huron County in your shoes for the next week until God calls us home because that's what the world needs to see. 270.
do thank you for the wonderful words of life. Thank you for the printed word, Lord, that we so appreciate and has so enriched our lives and our soul. But we thank you more so for the living word, the one who is the life, the way and the truth. Thank you for that good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. And oh, our God, as we go from this service today lord from this meeting we pray that we will go out to live for the glory of god and that people will see christ in us thank you father for your promise that said christ in you the hope of glory we pray that that will be revealed to others as we live amongst them in these days continue to bless this fellowship and all who have heard this word lord may it bring forth fruit for your glory in Jesus' name.